It's a rough time to be an anime fan, at least if you value your ability to sleep and get other stuff done. With Demon Slayer, Dr. Stone, Gundam Witch from Mercury, and Birdie Wing returning alongside Ancient Magus Bride and Ranking of Kings, plus Vinland Saga 2 still going strong from winter, Spring would have had a solid anime lineup even if every new show was a dud. But having just watched all 33 of the new premieres, I can assure you they are anything but, and even I'm struggling to figure out where I'll find time for them all. Lucky for those of you who can't make watching anime your full-time job, I've managed to whittle that stacked stack of shows down to the 10 that are most worth your time. These are the ones to watch for Spring 2023, brought to you by the Battle Cats. What are Battle Cats, you ask? Well, like regular cats, they're cute, weird, and dumb as rocks. But unlike useless little Bobby here, Battle Cats come packing a wide array of anime superpowers that you can use in your bid to take over the universe. A horde of zany critters stands in the way of your path to conquest, though, waiting for you to take them on in a simple and fun tower defense battle system. Pump up your worker cat for more resources, pump out your army to overwhelm the enemy forces, and if all else fails, hit them with a massive screen-clearing laser. Each kitty has its own quirky personality plus unique strengths and weaknesses, and it's your job to combine their abilities and build the perfect formation to tackle each mission. Though, with how charming these little guys can be, it's easy to let bias get in the way of strategy. Personally, I never leave the base without my delinquent cat, one of many mother effing anime references waiting for you in this game. Some of those available in limited time collab events are even official. Fate has ordained, I can't directly show you what those are, but you're smart, you'll figure it out. And getting new battle cats is so simple, even Bobby can do it. An uber rare one. Guess we're not giving you up this week. What are you waiting for? The universe ain't gonna conquer itself. Click the link below to start playing the Battle Cats today. Now with that out of the way, let's get into the anime. From Son Goku flipping Bulma's car to Monkey D. Luffy stabbing himself in the face, one of the marks of a great shonen hero is a memorable introduction. And while that's no guarantee that a series will carry on as it's begun, by having protagonist Gabimaru break a katana with his neck, Hell's Paradise is certainly off to a strong start. Sentenced to death for a bunch of crimes he definitely committed, the cold-blooded killer ninja claims to be more than happy to meet his end, though with skin too tough to burn and muscles so mighty he can't even be drawn and quartered, that's far easier said than done. Also, deep down, he's a closeted wife guy who only wants to live in peace with his sweetheart, which is the real reason his ninja clan had him arrested, so when he's offered a full pardon from the shogun and protection for his family as a reward for retrieving a certain and treasure, he's more than happy to jump at the chance. It's not just any treasure, though. The elixir of life is said to be hidden somewhere on a mysterious island called Paradise, from which no man has yet returned alive or without flowers growing out of his face. Hence why the Shogun has pulled together an elite yet expendable team of condemned criminals to nab the prize. A seppuku squad, if you will, only nanobombs and brain surgery haven't been invented yet, so each crook has to be paired with an elite executioner ready to cut their heads off the second they fall out of line. Which kind of defeats the purpose of sending expendable goons on the mission, but Protag Kun just ripped a dude's throat out with his teeth, so I really don't want to piss him off by nitpicking the logic of his series too much. Hell's Paradise is definitely one of those anime dominated by the rule of cool, but it is pretty damn cool, and it also has some surprisingly strong character writing underpinning its bombastic and bloody action that should hopefully give it some real depth and staying power. 
On the other end of the cosmological naming spectrum, Heavenly Delusion is a post-apocalyptic adventure that follows a pair of travelers as they trek across a ruined Japan, evading the strange monstrosities that brought about the end on their way toward an uncertain goal. With the younger of the two supposedly destined to save the world somehow and uniquely capable of taking out those monstrosities, and an older mercenary acting as protector while trying and failing to maintain professional distance, it's not hard to see shades of The Last of Us here, but Kiruko has one thing Joel definitely doesn't, a motherfucking laser gun, which will come in mighty handy as the pair chase rumors of a lost sanctuary known only as heaven, since those monstrosities I mentioned are a lot stranger and harder to kill than your run-of-the-mill mushroom zombies. In a brilliant flourish of dramatic irony, we actually get to see what heaven looks like right from the jump, a fancy eco-dome where plants flourish under artificial sunlight, and another group of kids gets to enjoy mostly carefree school lives, attended by robot servants and watched over by kindly old teachers who I'm sure have no ulterior motives whatsoever. All told, they have it pretty good, with little to worry about beyond your typical teenager stuff like drama, jealousy, and hormones, but curiosity is one of those inescapably human traits, and some of those kids are starting to wonder what lies outside the outside. My curiosity has likewise been piqued by the myriad mysteries lurking at the edges of both sides of this parallel story. There's a lot going on in this anime, and all of it is fascinating enough to grab my attention, even without the gorgeous artwork, sharp, tense direction, and lively animation, though I'm certainly not going to complain that those production values are there. I am so relieved that Disney Plus managed to keep this one out of jail, because it has the potential to be every bit as great as summertime rendering, and it would have been a real shame to see it fall into obscurity. Keeping up this whole afterlife theme we got going, our third entry explores the less famous third option that doesn't get a mention in Guilty Gear's battle intro. Necromancy. Deadmount Deathplay, the latest anime from the mind of Bakano and Durarara creator Ryogo Narita, opens on an epic battle between a noble knight cursed with an evil eye and a monstrous undead mage known only as the Corpse God, which doesn't go quite as planned. Right when it seems like the knight has won, the lich prepares a strange spell, and when the final blow is struck, the soul of our hero gets flung in to the body of a teenager in modern-day Tokyo. That's right, it's a rare reverse isekai. Finally free of the war-blighted, grimdark fantasy world he once called home, our hero resolves to renounce conflict and death and live the peaceful life he always dreamed of. But considering the body he just jumped into was assassinated moments prior with a crowbar to the neck, and the extremely hot crazy girl who did it would greatly prefer he stay that way, it might take a bit of work for him to get there. Especially since Polka Shinomiya, the timid rich kid whose body he hijacked doesn't exactly have the muscles to make up for the apparent lack of magic in our world and defend himself. I won't spoil exactly how the ensuing fight goes down, but I can promise you Unalived Mount Unalive play is a bloody good time with extremely fun over-the-top action and the same top-tier banter that you've come to expect from Bakano and Durarara. Not to mention some genuinely clever surprises that really caught me off guard. Equally surprisingly, that's the closest thing you'll find to an isekai in this video, outside the bargain bin at the end, that is. I can, however, offer you a pretty darn great pre-sekai in the form of Konosuba, an explosion on this wonderful world. A prequel spin-off that follows a young Megumin on her path to magehood, and more importantly, mastery of that most elusive and ultimate of spells, explosion, at the prestigious Crimson Demon Academy, where she and the other children of her genetically engineered super wizard clan learn valuable lessons about that most important aspect of combat and life, 
looking cool. Specifically, an edgy 12-year-old's concept of cool, which is the basis for their entire culture on account of how the Crimson Demons were genetically engineered by an otaku from our world. And that culture was easily the funniest part of the Konosuba movie, so getting to see it explored in more depth here, along with all the crazy characters around the village, is an absolute delight that should make fans of the original anime very happy. But what of potential new fans looking to this series as a possible fresh start? Well, I'm honestly in way too deep at this point to ever evaluate the anime on those terms, but I do think the comedic dynamic between Megumin, her rival Union, and their classmates, not to mention her crazy, poor family and the village at large, is plenty funny in a vacuum, and different enough from what makes Kazuma and Ko so entertaining that Konosuba Explosion is well worth a watch purely on its own merits. Though one thing it does have in common with its sister series, thankfully, is its hilariously expressive animation. Now, if that doesn't scratch your isekai itch, well, Skip and Loafer definitely won't either, but the fish out of water angles as good a segue as any into talking about this breathtakingly animated high school drama. Mitsumi Iwakura is a small town girl with big time dreams, aiming to crush it at university, seize wealth and power, and ultimately use that to save the floundering economy of her two horse town. She's off to a good start, too, having earned the class representative spot at one of Tokyo's most competitive high schools, but book smarts and street smarts are two very different things, and all the prep work in the world won't get her anywhere if she can't navigate the Tokyo Metro and actually make it to school first. Enter Shima Sosuke, a charming, laid-back slacker who happens upon Mitsumi in her darkest moment and finds himself doing the last thing he ever imagined on his first day, running his ass off to get to school on time. When you meet the right person, they can bring out a side of you you didn't know was there, and I think that's one of the most beautiful things in the world, though the visuals of this anime, especially the OP, come a very close second. Of course, how well a story about stuff like that will work ultimately depends on the strength of its characters, but thankfully that's exactly where Skip and Loafer excels the most. If you've been searching for another high school romantic drama that'll hit like Hori Mia, Look no further. On the other hand, if you're looking for a slightly more mature love story that scratches the same itch as Otakoi, my love story with Yamada at level 999 might just be the anime for you. When college student Akane Kinoshita's boyfriend dumps her for a girl he met in an MMO that they were supposed to be playing together, she takes it pretty hard and ironically ends up sinking even deeper into the game, taking her frustrations out on some random mobs and her extremely socially awkward guildmate Yamada, who was hoping to farm those mobs for a rare drop. But their relationship takes an unexpected turn at an offline event where Akane was hoping to make her ex jealous, where she ends up running into Yamada yet again, literally this time, and discovers in the process that not only is he shockingly hot, he's also a locally famous pro gamer, and more importantly, her ex is one of his reply guys. Instantly concocting the perfect revenge strategy, she bribes Yamada into posing as her new beau, an attack that proves to be not very effective, so they go out drinking. But once they actually get to talking in the aftermath of that embarrassment, Akane finds herself falling for the handsome, soft-spoken nerd. Despite his good looks, though, Yamada's never had a girlfriend, and he's basically oblivious to the entire world outside of games, so it's gonna take some serious work if Akane wants to claim that server first. Well, that's one high school romance and one set in college, so we may as well add middle school to the list with the dangers in my heart. We all know what they say about the quiet kid in class, but in Kyotaro Ichikawa's case, it's absolutely true. Beneath his emo fringe lurks the cold, calculating eye of a killer. And before that eye goes lazy on account of his haircut, he intends to end the happy-go-lucky moe anime atmosphere of his class by cutting up one of his popular classmates. Ideally, 
Anna Yamada, the tall, beautiful, and bubbly class idol whose bright and sunny disposition puts her in a whole different world from the dark loner anti-hero of this fearsome psycho thriller. Or at least that's what he tells himself. From the outside looking in, it kind of seems like Ichikawa is just going through a chuny edgelord phase. Flowers of evil, this anime ain't. When he catches Yamada alone in the library, pigging out on snacks behind her friend's backs, and learns she's actually a lot less put together than she first appears, Ichikawa finds himself compelled to encourage, rather than eviscerate, his ditzy classmate. Which is definitely why he bought the magazine that she modeled in and hides it under his pillow. Cause she, she just looks so sad that nobody bought it, that's why that's the only reason. And Yamada, for her part, finds herself increasingly drawn to that funny little weirdo in the library with all his adorable little overreactions. It's a very cute and wholesome series. Ichikawa may tell himself, I'm so fucked up. And he may even be kind of right, but it's middle school. Everyone's weird and awkward. Some kids just hide it better than others. And the dangers in my heart captures that delicate, embarrassing, transitory moment in our lives with gorgeous animation and a charming, slightly twisted sense of humor. This anime is basically Oh Maidens in Your Savage Season meets Teasing Master Takagi-san, and I am here for it. While I'm busy making Ava references, let's talk about Maho Shoujo Magical Destroyers, a magical girl anime that feels like it fell out of a parallel universe where the founder of Gainax never committed tax fraud and thus the band never broke up. Don't get me wrong, I love me some Trigger and Kara anime, but this one goes hard in a very specific way that I just haven't seen in over a decade, which makes it quite appropriate that the anime itself is set in 2011, three years into a total ban on all things anime and otherwise nerdy in Japan, where the only thing standing between the awo-faced forces of the fascist anti-anime regime and the total deotakufication of the nation is a small but scrappy band of nerdy rebels, based out of Akiba, of course, and led by the legendary otaku hero and his elite team of magical girls. Mysterious masked pink, stupid sexy blue, and leading the pack with a fiery passion that says, fuck your squad naming conventions, Maho Shoujo Anarchy. This definitely isn't a show for every kind of anime fan, but for the cool ones who fuck, it's blend of high-octane animation, over-the-top characterization, and balls-to-the-wall insanity in the plot department should make Magical Destroyers an instant all-time fave. And I promise it's deep-fried, distortion-heavy punk rock OP will be stuck in your heads for years to come. Now, that last anime was pretty intense, and I'm about to cap this list off with something even wilder, so let's take a quick breather by soaking up the sleepy vibes of Insomniacs After School. Or maybe I should say the tired yet frustratingly unsleepy vibes. The story of this one is exactly what it says on the tin. Ganta Nakami is known by his classmates as a lazy, off-putting grump, but his short temper and tendency to nap in class are in fact products of a chronic sleep disorder that leaves him staring at the ceiling till the sun comes up each night. When he stumbles on cute classmate Isaki Magari catching Z's in the school's supposedly haunted observatory, though, they both realize they're not as alone as they thought they were in their sleepless struggles. Before long, the pair begin sneaking out to enjoy each other's company and the liminal world of their town as their classmates and neighbors slumber. And that observatory becomes a secret base of sorts, a haven where they can recover from and help each other deal with the daily struggles that come with their shared condition. A little more small town and a lot more down to earth than last summer's non-sleeper hit Call of the Night, Insomniacs After School will almost certainly appeal to the same crowd, promising a relaxing and relatable look at the challenges that come with this common condition, and how having someone to share in your pain can change your whole world. 
Last but not least on the list is Oshinoko, easily my most anticipated new show of the season. I mean, how could a new story from Kaguya-sama creator Aka Akasaka not be? And I'm happy to report that its premiere absolutely exceeded my expectations in every possible way. Gorgeously animated by the artists at Doga Kobo, with top-notch acting and sound design to boot, and, of course, the incredible character writing and plotting that we've come to expect from that master mangaka. But I really don't want to say much more about that plot or those characters because holy shit, this first episode is an unpredictable roller coaster ride that absolutely earns its feature length runtime. I can tell you that its story of an up and coming teenage idol struggling to hide an unexpected pregnancy with the help of a doctor who happens to be a fan is exciting and emotional and shines quite the stark spotlight on the dark and dishonest side of Japan's entertainment industry. But beyond that, you'll have to trust me when I say this is one of those anime you want to experience blind. Oshinoko is also one of those anime that I am absolutely, without question, gonna write some sort of video essay about before the season's over, and there'll be no avoiding spoilers in that video, so get into this one while the getting's good. Before you get getting, though, don't forget we've still got a bargain bin to rummage through for those of you who weren't quite satisfied with my top recommendations. Starting with Mashal. With its simple, appealing concept of what if One Punch Man went to Hogwarts and used his muscles to pretend he was a wizard, plus some absolutely stunning action spreads, this is easily one of my favorite manga currently running in Shonen Jump. And its new anime adaptation is pretty darn solid too, but this season is just so darn stacked that anything short of exceptional couldn't make the cut. Too Cute Crisis was another very strong contender that very nearly made the list with its genuinely hilarious central joke of an alien researcher for an intergalactic empire wanting to get rid of all life on Earth, but being continually blown away by how insanely adorable all of our animals are. Would have made a great segue out of that Battle Cats ad too, but alas, I had to make cuts somewhere. That said, with its insanely gorgeous artwork and instantly lovable characters, the series series I had the hardest time taking off the list was definitely Otaku Elf. A charming little slice-of-life comedy about a 600-year-old anime and game-addicted elf who became enshrined as the local deity of a Japanese town after getting reverse isekai'd many years ago, and the put-upon teenage Miko who's tasked with serving her snacks and Red Bull in the modern day. It is seriously cute and incredibly funny with a very strong heart. Next up, The Sacrificial Princess and the King of Beasts, which I was lucky enough to get an advanced screener of courtesy of Crunchyroll, is a romantic fairy tale about a young human girl who's offered up to a race of man-eating beasts to maintain their species' hard-won, hundred-year-long peace. With a well-built world rendered in gorgeous watercolors, fantasy fanatics will find a lot to love in that series. And for that same crowd, the reason why Raylena ended up at the Duke's mansion makes a very strong case for itself with an unusually complex isekai premise. Our heroine has been reincarnated into the world of her favorite Regency mystery novel as the victim whose murder is supposed to kick the story off. Seeking to avert that horrible fate, she has to use her knowledge of the novel to insert herself into the dangerous political landscape of the nobility and find a way to undermine her fiancé and would-be killer. The next isekai in the bin, my one-hit kill sister, is slightly less intellectual than that. Its title probably evokes a whole host of assumptions in your mind, but rest assured it's even more ridiculously incesty than you'd expect. Like, Onesan is down so bad for her brother that she isekais herself just to be with him. What I didn't expect, though, was for the series to go as hard as it does with its animation, which seriously elevates what would otherwise be tepidly edgy comedy. 
On the opposite end of the isekai comedy spectrum, we have Kamikatsu, serving God in a godless world. A tale of a cult leader's son who wishes to be reborn in a land without religion after his dad's insanity gets him killed. This show's train wreck tier animation and pacing belie some seriously sharp-witted satire and truly audacious jokes that I am itching to talk about when it's time to do the hottest trash. I tell you what, I have seen a lot of things in anime, but this is the first one that's gone from zero to hand job CPR in four minutes flat. Speaking of compelling trash, The Café Terrace and Its Goddesses is a harem comedy about a dude who inherits his grandma's house and beachside cafe, and the five unbelievably hot squatters slash waitresses who try to seduce him into letting them stay there instead of tearing it down to build a parking lot. The story in this show is pretty basic, but its characters are incredibly endearing, and more importantly, the plot is some of the best I've seen animated in ages, speaking as a connoisseur of such things. In the meanwhile, here's a list of the 10 ones to watch and where you can watch them if you need a quick refresher before you go. I'm Jeff Thu, professional anime cat dad, and I really gotta go lint roller this jacket, so I'll see you later.